Welcome back. Let's take a look at the main parts or components that make up a computer. Do you remember from the last video which part of this picture is the actual computer? It's the grey box on the right. The other items are peripherals. In this case I'm talking about the keyboard, mouse and monitor. Let's take a look at the parts within the computer. The brain of a computer is its CPU or central processing unit to give it its full title. Some refer to the whole box as a CPU, but remember this is only one rather small part. It's a microchip that does all the computational work that the machine needs. Here we have a picture showing all the connecting pins on the underside of the chip. When looking in a machine, this component is normally hidden under a big heatsink. That's a metal device that has lots of fins that help to keep the chip cool. On top of this is usually a large fan to draw the heat away from the chip. As you may have guessed, these can run very hot and need constant cooling to keep them working. I said before that everything that a computer does is broken down into mathematics. It's the responsibility of the CPU to perform all of these mathematical calculations. The downside of a CPU is that it can only do a single calculation at a time. It does them really fast, which often means it feels as though it's doing several things at once, but it's actually only doing them in sequence really quickly. Newer systems overcome this by including multiple cores within the CPU. It's essentially strapping multiple CPUs into the one chip. So for example, a two core system is the equivalent of having two CPUs within the one chip, which allows two calculations to be done at the same time. It's common for newer laptops to have dual core processors. The term processor is just shorthand for CPU. Occasionally they have quad core processors. One of the drawbacks of having multiple cores is an increase in power consumption. So laptops tend to limit the number of cores to four. Newer desktop systems tend to start off with quad-core processors, but the newest top-end processors can have as many as 18 or more cores, but these cost a lot of money. The next key part of the computer is the RAM, or random access memory. As mentioned before, this is like a working area of short-term memory that the computer uses to store information that it is either using or needs quick access to. If you have several programs open on your computer, it will keep track of these along with any files that may be open. Therefore, the more RAM you have, the more easily the computer can handle larger or multiple things. In short, the more RAM the better. As a rough guide for Windows PCs running Windows 10, I would look to have at least 4GB of RAM. This will often be written as 4GB, and it's pronounced as 4GB. I'll explain in a later lecture exactly what this figure means, but look out for a number next to RAM in this format when looking at computer adverts. Windows will run with less RAM than 4 gig, but I would suggest this is a working minimum. If your budget allows, you'll notice a real benefit by increasing this further. The next step up tends to be to 8 gig. With this amount, the machine should be able to perform most tasks comfortably. If you're looking to do higher end work, perhaps photo or video editing, you may still need more. The system I use has 32 gig, which is rather a lot, even for me. The next component to look at is the hard drive. This is long term storage. It's much slower than RAM, but doesn't lose whatever is being stored when the power is lost. It's also much cheaper, allowing you to have much more space when compared to the price of RAM. It's used to store any programs, including the operating system itself, and any additional files you're keeping. Photos, videos, and documents, for example. If your machine is running short of RAM, it will also use some space on the hard drive to supplement the RAM. But as I mentioned, a hard drive is much slower than RAM. If you experience the computer slow down, particularly when you switch between applications, this is because it's having to switch over which program is using the RAM and which is using the hard disk. The last component that we're going to look at here ties everything to else together. It's called a motherboard and is used to connect all the other components together. Here's a diagram of a motherboard. Here's where the CPU goes. Here's where the RAM goes. And these connectors are used to connect up the hard drive. These other slots here are used to add additional cards or daughter boards. This could be graphics cards, allowing you to connect monitors to get visual output. 
or it may be a sound card to get audio output from the machine. Sometimes motherboards have this functionality built in and you just see the appropriate ports here. Even if this is the case, you can still add cards which have better performance than those built in. An example where this may be done is to add a graphics card into a machine. This may then allow you to use multiple monitors or have better performance than the one that's built into the motherboard. Let's take a look at an example of how these components work together to add two numbers. Let's represent each of the components we've just mentioned. The first thing I do is enter the first number on the keyboard. I've entered 1. As soon as you press the number 1 key, this action is passed to CPU for processing. At this point, the CPU doesn't know what to do with this number, so it moves it into RAM and waits for something else to happen. Now we enter the plus symbol. Again, as soon as you press the key, this action goes through the CPU to choose what to do next. Again, the CPU still doesn't know what you're doing, so it moves the symbol into RAM. Now I enter the second number, 2. As before, it goes through the CPU, which moves it into RAM and waits for the next action. Now I enter the equal symbol, which goes through the CPU. This time, the CPU works out that it needs to perform the calculation. So it calls the information back out of RAM and works out the result. Assuming we want to store this result long term, it will then output it to the hard drive. Let's finish off this lecture by taking a look at things that can impact performance. As I've mentioned, each of the key components of a computer have a very big impact on its performance. Consider what happens if a machine has a very slow CPU. It's going to take longer to perform its calculations. Actions are going to be queued up waiting for access to the CPU. Now consider what happens if you do not have enough RAM in the machine. I mentioned this briefly already. It's going to use space on the hard drive to supplement the RAM. As accessing the hard drive is much slower, it's going to take longer to move the, and retrieve the information. If you have a slow hard drive, it'll take longer to store and retrieve information. The latest hard drive technology, SSD or solid state drives, are very fast and you'll normally notice a big speed increase if your machine has one of these. The main impact on performance for a hard drive is when it starts running out of space. When this happens, the first thing you'll notice is that the machine can no longer use the hard drive to supplement the RAM. This can have a significant impact on performance as the machine struggles to switch data between hard drive and RAM. Also, as the drive fills up, it takes longer to find and retrieve the information that you have requested. Often, data isn't stored sequentially on the drive. It can be spread or scattered across the whole drive. This often happens if lots of files have been stored and deleted over time. This is called fragmentation, and it will take longer for the machine to locate all the parts of the data. The final major area that impacts on performance is network bandwidth. The majority of devices now are connected to a network. This could be the internet or a company's internal network. Bandwidth is the amount of information in the form of ones and zeros that can be moved in one go or within a specific time. So the more bandwidth, the quicker the information can be moved. Simple. In conclusion, the two key elements to consider are speed and capacity. If you are lacking in either of these with any of the components or areas we've talked about, you're going to have a bottleneck. This means that instructions will need to be queued to be processed, and therefore it slows the machine down. In this lecture, we've looked at the main parts that make up a computer and explained how these work together to perform tasks. I gave an example of adding two numbers together. We've also taken a look at what can impact performance. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.